Umberto, the master of fellatio, will not be heard this evening. I'm Rick Gilmore. This is the Rick Gilmore program. Portions of the following broadcast may be found objectionable to some members of the radio listening audience. Therefore, listener discretion is advised. The views on this program are mine and the callers and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of WTAM or Clear Channel or Bowery Mays or anyone else. I just thought I'd play a little number before I go back to the phones. This one goes out to the man in the Oval Office. Thank you, System of a Down. Phone number here, 578-1100 in the classic 216 area code, toll free, 888 wtam Sheesh. Sheesh. I voted for this guy, and I'm sorry. I apologize to the nation for spending so much time supporting our current president. John, I held you through. You were telling a little story, and it says up here on the big board, you think I'm the Conan O'Brien of radio. Yeah, you're Conan O'Brien, because you've got a cult following. Conan's the same way. Oh, I see. You know, Conan, I couldn't believe he's been on for ten years. I know. The only thing I ever had an objection to Conan was when he first came on, he had a picture of Ernie Kovacs on the wall behind him, and I thought, how dare he? Yes. But maybe, ma maybe he just liked Ernie, and so if he does, well, then how dare he not, I guess. I felt the same way, but you don't want to, you know, when I saw him, too, I was like, and Ernie was a classic. Ernie was, was it. He was television as far as creativity is concerned back then. You're right. Um, hey, you know what? You're going to tell Cliff Bakley he's going to change his diet. Why is that? He has to get out of the bathroom faster than what he just did. No, well, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not going there. Anyway, go ahead. It's okay, you won't go there. Hey, listen, okay, here's the story, all right? Yeah. First of all, I, I want to say one more thing. I got a complaint against Mother's Against Drunk Driving, and I'll get to that in a second. But this guy, the cemetery, this, this cemetery story. Oh, yeah, there's a guy who lived in Riverside Cemetery for 15 years. Right. And then he came back to life and bought a Buick. Or something like that. Yeah, that's how the story went. Now I remember. Uh, okay, writer's embellishments. Here we go. Yes. He worked there at age, like, 14, okay? Oh, he worked and in the cemetery. He worked in the cemetery. I dig it, and yeah. He drove for the first time in the cemetery, because you can't at the cemetery for quite a lot. Well, that's but, right. Who are you going to hit? Somebody that's already dead. Exactly. Right. I mean, the, the risk is pretty low. Yeah, but you could do burnouts on headstones. And your ins But your insurance rates are just like nothing, you know? Well, yeah. Anyways. So, in 1978, Yes. now, he worked there for 14 years, a guy had worked there for 16 years, and in 1978, and they had a car, it was a cemetery car, okay? Okay. 1964 Bel Air. Cool. Okay? Yeah. 14-year-old car, they put it up for sale for 500 bucks. It had on it, I'm not kidding when I tell you this, it had on it 468 original miles. Well, it never went anywhere. Exactly. It went from the gate at the cemetery and guided the, the funeral procession into the headstone. 468 original, there's cemetery miles, so you gotta be careful there. But 468 miles, and they were selling it for 500 bucks, and he got out, he got out bid because he didn't have seniority. Wow. 64 bill. That was, that, to me, that's like the ultimate in, oh my God, I have a classic car available, I can't get it. So that's not urban myth and legend. You will swear on a stack of Bibles and yes. on, your, on your mother's eyes that that's exactly. the truth. The guy's my, he's my partner, yeah. Okay. Hey, what's He's your partner? partner? Are you gay? In my business. Oh, oh, okay. Well, just, you know. <laughs> That's another, another, another subject matter. Yes, well, hey, of course. Why we'll not get into that? Complaint. Huh? Here's my complaint against mad, okay? Yeah. They're coming out with... Yes. First-time offenders have to have the drunk plate. Ooh. The yellow background red letters. Yes, sir. First-time offenders. Wow. To me, now I'm going to join Dam. To me, that's pretty, that, you know, you don't have to give a, give a person uh, a chance to, to correct their mistake. Damn, drunks against mad mothers? Exactly. Okay. And I'm thinking, you know what, why should we stop at just drunk drivers? Why can't we get, like, black ones for murderers? And okay? pink ones for homosexuals and... You know, well, I'm looking at somebody who's, like, going to harm us, okay? Right. Oh. Now, if, if, you, if you come up to a, a black plate with white letters, you know what's a murderer? You're not going to cut them off, are you? Uh, <laughs> pardon me. Not, not unless I have my Mossberg 500 Bullpup 12 sitting next to me on the front seat. Exactly. So you, you can really do a service, mothers against drunk driving, to expand this to other people. So that, we're manslaughter. We know he drives like crazy. So that little weasel that I saw at the gas station, you have to move your car. You have to move your car. You have to move your car because I was in a handicap spot for two seconds. I don't think he'd do that if I had a black and white plate that said exactly. that I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. Now why, Johnny Cash, yeah. now why can't I... 
Why can I not get a ticket for taking a dump in a handicap stall? But I don't know. Park, no, sir. You got to go with the poopy talk, don't you? What are you, crazy? His behavior has been erratic, uh, to say the least. But but I would I, I think it would be presumptuous for me to say that, that, that he's mentally ill. Yeah, probably going a little far there. John, you're, you're on the air. Go ahead. Hey, wake up. Hey. You there? Oh, I'm, uh, am I on? You're, I'm you're, you're on. What are you... I thought you were breaking for a commercial. I'm sorry. Well, why would, would normally when I break for a commercial, I say stay tuned for these important words. Oh, I'm sorry, Rick. No, it's all right. Hey, I, I just wanted to tell you that uh, I've talked to you before about the war in Iraq and about the Bush presidency. The thing that really boggles my mind, Rick, and I'm not going to repeat that trite phrase about uh, knowing your history because you're, you're going to repeat it, bound to repeat it if you don't. What boggles me is there are so many parallels between what happened a half generation ago halfway around the world in Southeast Asia and what's happening in the, in the Middle East and why the people in power haven't learned those lessons. And I think I know what part of the reason why the people in power haven't learned these lessons because try as they may, Rick, uh, as we know and you've said it, this thing in the Middle East has been and will always be about oil until something changes. Uh, I believe you're right. Uh, I believe that has to be a large part of it. It doesn't have to be entirely about oil, but it certainly is a, a piece of the puzzle, a part of the equation, isn't it? Which is, that's correct, which is why, even though I'm a Democrat, even though I didn't vote, vote for Bush, and even if I, I vote for a Democrat next November and a Democrat's elected, I wonder how much the overall global landscape is going to change there. It's not going to. That's, that's the sad part when I have this conversation with people. I say the sad part is, is that it doesn't matter whether it's someone who's a Democrat or someone who's a Republican. Uh, I mean, you know, George W. Bush did not get the majority of the vote in the last election, but just right. tell that to the Electoral College and see if they care. Right, and Clinton didn't get the majority of the vote in the 92 election, nor I believe in the 96 election. See, it seems to me almost it's conspiratorial in nature to think that these people sit down and go, who can we pick that'll play go along, get along? And, uh, right. you know, we got the, the Bilderbergers and the Eye and the Dollar Bill and the Bavarian Illuminati and the Skull and Bones, and uh, they're all sitting around going, hmm, right. let's think 20 years down the road. Let's keep thinking 20 years down the road and who we can take over next and, and what we can do. And, then, and you and I and our children and their children are going to continue to be pawns in this because they're not the power brokers. Well, look at Henry Kissinger who said third world countries are nothing but crap factories that they don't do anything for us, so they should just go die. Right. You really think we're going to try and cure AIDS in Africa? No. 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 We don't care less because there's nothing over there that we need. Right. And we don't really right. need diamonds, do we? Which is why it's been the same since European colonialists uh, left it. Yeah, and, and, and it's a shame, but I'm beginning to think that it's the truth. Yeah. That it doesn't matter who we vote for, it doesn't matter who gets in there. I mean, you know, you look at General Wesley Clark, I think that they're going to slit his throat because he knows where all the bodies are buried, and he's going to stumble and fumble, and then they're going to find reasons why he won't get elected, and you won't have to worry about having a general in the White House because we ain't going to have one because, if, if, you know, it's almost as if they've already got the next election all figured out. Right, right. Rick, keep up the good work on Sundays. I love hearing you. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. All right, bye-bye. Now, that's a rather depressing thought, if you put it that way. Well, gee, it doesn't matter who we vote for in this two-party system. That's why I'm pushing for something revolutionary. Online voting. Oh, they hate that, Rick. They don't want online voting. It'll fracture the two-party system. No, really? Good. If Thomas Jefferson were still alive... Do you think he would be for or against online voting? You can sit on your lazy ass at home and push a button on your computer and vote. Now it doesn't involve going out in the rain, getting in your car, taking a bus, or walking. Oh, they wouldn't like that, Rick. Not at all. Because people would actually vote. Now, do you think Thomas Jefferson would be for that or against it? Well, they're against it, and they're not even worried about voter fraud. They're worried about fracturing the two-party system. It was, it was Jefferson himself. That little slave schwanker <laughs> that said, we need a revolution in this country every 20 years. We said that a long time ago. Maybe we do. But Rick, that's un-American. Oh, okay. So Thomas Jefferson's un-American.
Think about it. Think about it. This program will come to order. Order! 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 Come to order! Harumph! Hey, no harumphing back there, you. Larry, you're on the air. Good evening, my king. Uh, you want to do the weather with me? You yes, sure thing, buddy. All right. You want to do it with the music or without the music? Oh, uh, music. Eileen McShay, man. Bring her on. All right. TV3 is Eileen McShay with her triple Doppler forecast. Tonight's cool and cloudy. What do you think it's going to be for a low? Uh, 40s. Mid 40s. Mid 40s. And tomorrow, more of the same weather. And what do you think it's going to be then? They're talking snow this week, dude. <coughs> I'm what? Not kidding. Oh, dear God. Mid 50s. Currently, you know what it is right now? No, I don't. It's 50. It's 50 degrees in Cleveland. 50? 50. You know, tomorrow on uh, Wells and Coleman in the morning, you can get your best Browns coverage with the KJ, Bush, Davis, Doug Deacon. Wake up informed, of course. Don't be a dum dum. Wake up and. Are you breathing heavy? No. Oh, okay. Uh, wake up and farm and listen to Wells and Coleman every weekday morning from 5 until 9 here on the big one. And you know what they call 47 guys sitting around watching the Super Bowl, don't you? Yeah, the Browns. I know. I didn't even watch them, dude. I watched NASCAR. Did you? Did you yeah. see that big crash? Oh, it was awesome. I didn't see it. Paul Ratto was telling me all about it. Oh, that was awesome. Yeah. Uh, and Ratto keeps getting larger. It was, it was a... I think he's up to about three and a half now. It was, it was good, didn't it? He could barely fit into his pullover. You want to hear this? I mean, the race is over, and these clowns crash. I mean, he's got to have like a 42-inch waist now. Hey, I give him credit, man. Oh, and anyway, you were talking about the race. I'm sorry, but I digress. <laughs> oh, and I'll talk about, about a lot of things. Hey, getting back to this dork at the gas station. The knob, yeah. Okay, let me, okay, no, no. Is he short and got glasses? Yes. Oh, dude, let me tell you, man. I, you're, I'm, it's around the corner from my house. No, oh, okay. Mother runs the place. I pull in. If you, oh man, he's. I don't know. I like to go in there and smack him. I went in there one time, and I would did the same thing as you. Was it was it was kind of crowded, but it wasn't. He wouldn't wait on me because I was parked in a handicap spot. I was waiting for him to not wait on me until I moved my car. I was. I started screaming at him that I was handicapped because I just wanted him to shut up and and, and you know give me my pack of cigarettes and let me get out of there. Uh, so I just. I says, dude. I, I, I just, and I, I can't tell you on the radio what I told him, but I told him a lot, and I just, you know, I told him take the whole store and crank it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy, I was, I was not impressed with his bedside manner. No, he's a little dork. Uh, his mother is a man. I think his mom manages a. Well, he's not a public figure, and I don't want to make him one. No, I just I don't was. Wanna, I just, you know, you, know, I, okay, I you gotta move your car. You gotta move your car. Started making me think about who's the biggest knob on the planet, and then, then for some reason the president ended up on the short list. I'm surprised you don't hit the, the BP up over by, the, by your station. Well, I do. I, I stopped there, too, and the guy overcharged me, and uh, so I, I didn't go back there. Yeah. I, uh, you know, the, the, the BP up here, yeah, I, I, bought, I bought two of those. You buy two packs of cools and get one free. Uh -huh. So I said, give me two of those. I'm not even thinking, because he's complaining about people calling him and complaining about how there's water in the gasoline and what's he got to do with it. And so I get two of those, buy two, get one free, and an OJ, and a thing of Tums. And it was $19.06, and I don't even think I hand him a $20 bill and a nickel or was six cents or whatever, and he gives me a dollar back. And I, then I get to the station, and I'm like, that, there's no way in hell that that could be. If, if, the, if the cigarettes are three fifty a pack, that seven and seven is fourteen. The OJ is a buck, and the Tums are fifty cents. You know, I'm looking at fourteen something, fifteen, no, not nineteen oh six. I'm thinking, did he just scam me, or, or did he do something wrong and just like rang up three packs of cigarettes plus three more packs? You know, and he did whatever he did. I'm out like five or six bucks, and I thought, well, I'm not going to drive back there and, you know, argue with the guy. I didn't even get a receipt, dummy right. me. You know, so, hey, what are you going to do anywhere you go? You know, they're everywhere, Larry. Well, I don't know what to tell you, man. I mean, I've been there, done that before, and it's like, I went, I got, I'm halfway home. I'm like, wait a minute, this guy just got, you know, and it's like, I don't want to go back, like she says, I don't want to go back there. I didn't get a receipt. You know, I'm just going to cause much. I'll probably end up in jail. I don't want to do that. Yeah, I'd probably go back there and punch somebody in the face. Hey, uh, not uh, you, see, you see Sokolowski is in the paper. You see uh, uh, that Stevie Van Zandt from The Sopranos was in town? I did not see that. Yeah, it was in the paper. I guess he was with some uh, record guy from Cleveland, and they were in there chowing. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, well, it's a good place to eat. You know? Yeah, oh, I know. I, I'm, I'm on a diet. I, I've been, you know, I've been hearing about how good the food is. Well, uh, have you lost any weight? Dude, yeah, I lost 210 pounds, man. Good God, you lost two of me's. You know, yeah, a, little, a year and two weeks. 
Actually, not quite two amis. You lost one and a half amis. I'm trying to, I want, by Christmas, I want to try to get down at least 400. Okay, I'm trying to get down to my birth weight. You know, but it's okay, because I once while I celebrate, I go and have me a couple ultra lights. A couple of ultra lights and a pork crown roast. <laughs> no, I no, dude. I don't. I haven't had a dude. I don't eat fast food no more. I haven't had a burger, none of that stuff. I haven't had steak. I had none of that stuff. I'm, I'm Polish, man. You know, I'm waiting for this pork sauerkraut and dumpling dinner. Huh. Well, you know, the sauerkraut's okay. Yeah, oh, I, lo yeah, I eat it raw like that, you know. Yeah, that'll clean you out. You'll, you'll be down and <laughs> go on the, go on the uh, sauerkraut diet there, you know. You'll, you'll be dehydrated and down to 150 pounds in no time. Yeah, well, I'm working on it, bro. All right, well. Wait, well, I'm going to tell you what. Um, oh, man, I'm thinking about Eileen McShay, boy. Ooh, she's a hottie. Wow, yeah, well, hey. I know, she's married. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. Hands, okay, hands off there, hands off. I know, well, you have a good one, buddy. I'll be in touch. All right, I already do. Rick Gilmore, media darling. You know, he doesn't have to be a media darling. No, I don't have to be, but I am. Still celebrating being chosen scenes 2003 Radio Personality of the Year. How do they choose that? I looked through the whole scene magazine last week, and I couldn't figure out how do they choose that. Do the editors sit down and go, hmm, harumph, hmm, I don't know. Good question. Um, what are you going to do? I'll take it. Right, Jeff? Hey. Hey. Yes. Hay is for horses and cows that go mow. Uh, no, why don't we all eat some oats? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now we're down to the 12-year-old level. Let's have a conversation about politics. Yeah. We're down to the president's level. Well, you know, uh, exactly. I, I voted for him. It was like, pick, you know, pick your poison. I'm sorry that I did. Yeah, you picked the stronger poison. You should have gone for the Robitussin DM, which would have been more soothing, I guess. I don't know. All he's done is fleece the American people's taxes. He's fleeced our rights. Oh, no, he gave us $300. Yeah, and he took it back by, uh, you know, letting them come in and jack up the gasoline prices and everything else like that. They got that right back from us. Did you, did you see in the paper where they said Walmart's going to lower their prices? Yeah. Can you hold your thoughts? Yeah. All right, hang on there, Tiger. Yeah, Walmart's going to lower their prices while well, they can afford to because all that stuff's made in China. More on the program after these important words and coverage of what in the world's happening. I'm Rick Gilmore, the thinking man's friend, and this is Cleveland's only news radio, WTAM 1100. What happened to the good music? No hives, no vines, no white strips, no queens of the Stone Age. That kind of stuff, or, or, or a Led Zeppelin, rock and roll. You know, stuff that reflects my program. There we go. Not three doors down, you know. I prefer this stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bions. Rick Gilmore. The media darling. On News Radio WTAM 1100. Is this the version that never goes anywhere? No words. This goes around and around. It's like sitting in a rocking chair. Here we go. Back and forth. Back and forth. Back and forth. Yeah. We'll never get free at that rate. You know what we had to do, Edmund? We had to just erase Edmund. They put that loop de loop de loop de loop version in there. What do they think this is? What do you think? With a 50,000 watt radio station that broadcasts the 38 states and half. Oh, wait a minute. I guess you know, we are. I should probably act a little more professional here. I sat and called the president a knob. Perhaps I should just say that he's sadly uninformed. Now, Jeff from Westlake, you were about to form a thought, and then we went to the news. Oh, yeah, well, you're right about that. He is a knob, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, I, it just seems to me that on the short list, I think, does this guy have any idea what he's doing? No, no, he, he, he's just a puppet. He's, he's, he's yes. like, uh, and, and he acts like he's a kid at daddy's business, that, you know, like, I can do whatever I want because this is my daddy's business. No, I'll ruin the Rangers, too, while I'm at it. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's the way he acts. No, he works for us. You know, I was just reading, you know, the plane Damn dealer. straight. Talking about the Paycheck Act. The yeah. plane dealer today. Yeah. And just make it real short here. Uh, that the American uh, civilly, uh, civil, civil liberties... A little, been, been a little, a little drinking done no, tonight? No, actually, no, I don't really participate. You had a stroke or Not something? Today. Or, yeah, oh. my throat. Okay. It says here, uh, quote, it says, Once the American public understands that many of the powers granted to the federal government applies a much more than just terrorism, I think the opposition will gain momentum. 
stating the fact that you know the Patriot Act was is not just being used for, to fight terrorism, but the you know the fight against uh, the average Jane and John Doe's or Jane Doe's or Joe Doe's or whatever you want to call them. It's not just for foreigners anymore. No, it's it's against its own American people. I, that's why I'm saying you know Bush has fleeced American peoples with their taxes, uh, is fleecing our rights. Uh, who who else is going to be running in the next election? Uh, you know, the Clintons like uh, are trying to get in there and get his wife in there. I guarantee you that if Al Gore throws his hat in the ring, Hillary is going to throw her hat in the ring because she doesn't want to have to wait until she's too old to run. Oh, yeah. She's, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see her running. I wouldn't be surprised if she decided to ran, run with Wesley Clark as her VP. How's that for a prediction? Yeah, I wouldn't doubt that. You know, people got to remember that Clinton uh, said that we deserved what happened to us for nine, from 9-11. People got to remember that. Yeah, I, well, I've got you on the line here. This story off the wire, I just want to get the reaction. I'll throw this into the mix as well while we're wondering whether the president's a knob or not. How about that uh, 14-month-old boy, uh, the, the Amber Alert worked and got him back, and then the, that girl locally around here, they found her. And well, How come the little white girl gets an Amber Alert and the little black girl that's been missing for two weeks doesn't? I, I don't understand that. It's interesting. Isn't it? Because they put out an Amber Alert, and this other kid, she was missing for like 12 hours, and they put out an Amber Alert, and she's this little white kid, and then the, the little black kid, I guess she doesn't count as much. I mean, they go door to door looking for her, but no Amber Alert for her? Do they, do they have a time frame, and they say, well, if we didn't get an Amber Alert out in the first 12 hours, it's not worth putting one out, or I, I, don't, I don't understand. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. Maybe that's what it is. I mean, maybe I'm just, you know, grasping at straws here, wondering why they didn't put one out. Well, then why didn't they put one out two weeks ago on, on her? Well, Gilly, you're gas grasping at straws. I, I guess I am. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Have a good evening, man. All right, you too. Well, it's just something to consider, isn't it? What, is the little black girl less important than the little white girl? I just have to ask these questions. I'm sorry. That's, you know, that's my job, or at least my interpretation of my job. Joe, you're calling from Indiana? Yeah, Indianapolis. I'm from Provo, Utah, actually. I'm an over-the-road driver, and I'm broke down here in Indianapolis waiting for a guy to get out here and fix me. <laughs> so Provo, Utah. So I'm Rick Gilmore, and you're probably familiar more with Gary Gilmore. Well, um, no, I'm not too familiar with him at all, but I just happened to catch a show. I, I scan around trying to find some intelligent conversation at night. Thank God you're there. Well, I, I do what I can. Well... You know, I'm so tired of the, uh, the shills for Bush, you know, and I really mean that. These guys, you know, Hannity and these guys, you know, all they do is it's, it's just, it's just uh, anecdotal rhetoric. You know, I, that's why I'm doing this program. I listen to those shows and I, I start pulling my hair out and I think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't get angry, get even. Yeah, well, we, I appreciate you doing it and I just want you to know, I decided to do something for the same reason. I'm running for U.S. Senate in Utah in 2004. And I formed a party called the Being Human Party. And the principal focus for me, I've got like 35 issues that I'm going to work on. One of them is transportation. Um, deals with the fact that I, I looked at all the different parties and I went, you know what? They're all about us and them. And we need to get off that. And so I created this party called the Being Human Party because there is no us and them with human beings. There's just we the people that happen to have a diversity of ideas and thoughts and so forth. And that the real issue for me as an entrepreneur, as a business person, and as, an, as, a, as a human being is, is it's, this is all about corporations. They own our government. They own the direction we go in our lives because of that, the influences. Uh, and so my focus is, one, to set an, a standard or example, I guess, to move a proposition forward. Um, this only being moved forward by some, and that is I'm taking no money from corporations or special interests. I'm using the Internet, which I think is a very powerful tool and becoming more so, to really get the message out there, really start talking about these issues. Absolutely. How do you think Howard Dean is earning his money? That's right. Getting it 200 bucks at a time instead of 2000 and you're done. Or what, you know what I mean? He's getting a 20 bucks here, 100 bucks there. That's, that's right. And, and that's, why they're, that's why they're so afraid of on, online voting. Sure. Well, and I've had people who wanted to give me money, you know, they go, great, you know, uh, can I donate to your campaign? And I'm telling people, no, I don't even want you to donate. What I want you to do, because my challenge, I'm running is just Joe. 
And I'm really trying to send a message home saying, look, you know what? This is my country, but this is yours. And you know what the real problem is? The problem isn't Bush. The problem isn't the fact that we had a Senate that hasn't debated and is now just beginning to debate long way too late uh, in, in the picture, especially for those young people getting killed over there and the people that were killing over there. I've got an idea. You should run as the average Joe. I am. I'm yeah. running as the average Joe, and I'm saying, you know, something... Joe Sixpack. Well, no, I don't know about that, but, yeah, the yeah. average Joe. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm saying, you know, I'm just, I'm just Joe, folks, and here's the deal. The real problem is, is we have been asleep at the wheel. We're supposed to be the masters of this country, each of us. And we've been convinced that we're not, and so we've let these guys buy us out. Well, you know what? It's not an easy road being human. It takes a lot of work. But by God, if we roll up our sleeves and start doing it, start paying attention to our community, start building our relations again, start getting our focus on aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas and start, you know, building and getting rid of subsidization, get rid of, get rid of uh, bailouts. I don't get them. You don't get them. The small business, which is 80% of the GNP, doesn't get any of that benefit. It works against us. I saw it when I was a kid. They were subsidizing the Midwest far dairy farmer. I lived in New England. They subsidized the Midwest dairy farmer so that they could ship milk from the Midwest and sell it cheaper than we could produce it in New England. And I watched a farmer actually pour his milk out on the ground because he called up to have him come pick it up and they weren't picking up. They didn't even call him. He had to call them to find out they weren't going to pick up anymore. Why? Because the federal government used our taxpayer money to disadvantage the New England farmer and the small business farm, you know, the, the small family farm, in order to create a corporate uh, deal out there. And that's the way it is in almost every aspect of our lives now. You know what, Joe? You make a lot of sense. You have a pencil and paper handy? Yeah. Write down my email and keep in touch with me. Gilly, G-I-L-L-Y, at W-T-A-M dot com. G-I-L-L-Y? Yeah, at, you know, the little ampersand, that at W-T-A-M dot com. Yeah, w, I, I pulled up your website while I was listening. Yeah, well, you know, and don't believe everything that's on the website, because none of it's true. It says I live in Westlake with my girlfriend and my pet rat. <laughs> well, she's, no, a ra I, I just, uh... she's, she's a rat, and the rat died. <laughs> well, I, I, um, I uh, because I'm building out, the, it's about a month out from having the website up, and I wanted to get you and others as links. You know, I'm creating a resource center for people to be able to link on to relevant conversation that is critical to our survival, really. You're absolutely right. That, that is the wave of the future, is, is trying to unite people through the Internet. I, I don't see any other way that the average people can sit around and get in touch with, you, with each other and how they really feel about issues. And, and like I say, online voting could be next, but they're really against it because they're afraid it'll fracture the two-party system. That's right. Well, check this out. You think, you think this is fracturing the party system, adding a third alternative. This is a global political initiative. This isn't a national political initiative. It's a global, political, spiritual, ethical initiative. Now, the, 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 what you're fighting, though, is what we have now is also global. It's a global plantation we live on now. Oh, yeah, and the no, corporations no. are milk... Walmart's going to lower their prices. Well, yeah, they... Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> but this is all about... Uh, basically, it's about the, the first sentence in this whole thing is human beings are corporations. One will serve the other. The choice is critical to our survival. We better make up our mind. And basically, the bottom line is, is that the whole idea behind this is to promote the belief that as human beings, there's no us and them, there's just we the people, and that our focus needs to be to understand that whatever global change that we want to, to affect has to work with the existing local initiatives that are sensitive to the unique cultures and customs of that specific area. Yep. And in doing that, we respect the sovereignty and self-determination of each individual and each community. Joe, order, it would, Joe, I can't let you go on all night, but I wish you luck. Thanks keep, a lot, bud. Keep, keep in touch. UK, bye. All right, yeah. Can't let you read your entire campaign platform, I, but I heard enough of it to, to think that you're on the right track. I do not want to run... I do not want to get into the political realm, but I am extremely interested in people who are trying to make a difference and are trying to make a change. And I know this is only a little radio program, but what are the other little radio programs? Is Glenn Beck more special than I am? Is Rush Limbaugh more special than I am? Not when I look in the mirror. I don't look in the mirror and see someone else. They look in the mirror and see themselves. If that's how they feel, that's fine. And I look in the mirror when I wake up and I look and after I, I'll wake up tomorrow and look in the mirror and say, I'm damn proud of what I said. 
because I believe it. And some people wear their heart on their sleeve. Mine's sitting there, look, it's bleeding. Apparently, but, uh, you know, disagree with me or not, all I want you to do is think, please. Just sit around and, instead of mindless pap, maybe you can sit around on a Sunday night and just go, hmm, well, hmm. Everything is not what it seems. Right, Jake? Yeah, Rick, speaking of people on the right track, uh, if you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, you're going the wrong way, homie. But that's just because I'm lost in freaking Kent, Ohio, all right? Well, what are you, you're driving truck, but what are you doing in Kent? <laughs> Trying to deliver groceries. Yeah, you know, I've gone to Kent to do a TV show once a couple of years ago, and I had a map of how to get there, and uh -huh. then, then we lost the map while we were there. And so try to try to get out. I ended up on uh, driving down 82 until I finally got to a highway somewhere. I was like, sheesh. I mean, the place is impossible to get. A Ravenna, Kent, that whole area. It's like a nightmare unless you're a cow farmer that grew up there or a college kid that lives there. Nobody has any idea. It's like driving around. You ever dri it's, it's, it's more confusing than Wheeling, West Virginia. Now, wait a minute. And Wheeling's pretty confusing. I end up on, I end up on Oaf Street. I end up on Oaf Street. Everywhere, I, every time I turn around, I'm back on Oaf Street. Yeah, good thing you're not in Atlanta because you'd be on Peach Street Street. But at least, at least I'd have a Waffle House on every corner I could stop and eat. <laughs> I'm glad two of morons are now, I guess they left Denny's alone, but uh, now they're suing Waffle House because the black people were discriminated against in the Waffle House. It's like, hey, Ace, you know, if you don't know what's going on in the world, it, it, me as a white guy, I uh, don't go into Compton and ask freaking directions because I'm going to get shot at. I'm going to get the hell beaten out of me, you know, and then who am I going to sue? That's you know, another, con how about Lancaster, Ohio? What about it? That's confusing, too. That's where my girlfriend's from. I stopped there once. I was driving a two-year-old ex-cop car, but it looked like a brand new old cop car that they were still using. I stopped there to ask for directions, and that guy gave me the wrong directions because he thought I was a cop. How about... <laughs> he gave me the wrong directions on purpose. He sent me around in circles in Lancaster. I'm going up one hill and down the next. I don't know. Okay, I'm driving to Florida, and... I'm in South Carolina, pull, in, pull off the uh, highway, uh, go to the gas station, and there's a female uh, police officer in there. And I says, oh, you'll know, because I'm driving, I'm trying to stay awake, the wife's sleeping, I'm going to get me a freaking uh, big golf Dr. Pepper. And I'm like, dude, I want some donuts bad. So I asked the lady cop, I'm like, hey, you'll know. Uh, where's the nearest donut shop around here? And she said, why, you so-and-so. <laughs> I'm like, it's because you're a cop, not because you're a freaking uh, donut eater, you weirdo. But is, that, is, that what you th is that what she thought? We, yeah, she thought I was saying it because she was a donut eater. But well, the last time I stopped in South Carolina, I stopped at a gas station. I went in to take a leak, and I'm peeing on a dead palmetto bug, which, is, for those who don't know, <laughs> is just a giant cockroach. What's the state bird of uh, South Carolina? Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you. That's one state I would not live in. No. South hotter than hell. I lived in Florida, and South Carolina's hotter. Well, they don't have any breeze, it seems like. You know, it's just hot, and the air never moves. It's like you could cut like cutting a pound cake, you know? The, the air is just like a pound cake. <laughs> I really wanted to call Rick just to uh, temper your chagrin, I suppose, uh, about Mr. Bush. And I'm glad you throw in the, uh, now you're coming around to my way of thinking on old Wesley Clark, because he's a nut job. But, uh, and say, you're saying the Gore thing, but I just like you to keep saying it, because I listen to a lot of alternative radio, and all it is is Bush bashing. And I'm like, dude, don't think that anything would be different if Mr. Gore was in there or any other moron that we got. We need election reform. We need people. Yes. Uh, hey, dude, listen to this. We need term limits. <laughs> well, I don't know if that. Yeah, we need it. We need a lot of stuff. But we need to get the people. Ross Perot did us a great favor by bringing up the issues that matter. I'm right in front of the uh, payphone that I first called you whenever the hell you started taking over for the other goof uh, at night on weekdays, which was beautiful because I drive at night, and uh, you were talking about Dr. Laura. August 28th, 1997. There you go, baby. 
So there I just went by the phone booth. I still don't know where I'm freaking at. But anyways, uh, yeah, we, we need election reform bad. We need everybody to just do some uh, a little bit of work and call their freaking uh, local representatives and then get on the horn with the Federal Election Commission and tell them we need to change this or there is going to be rev revolution. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, way back when when you called her. Wouldn't that just be full circle that you called uh, maybe the first one of the first nights I was on and then they'll fire me because I called the president on a knob. <laughs> I think you'll be okay. They yeah. like you around there. They don't, they, don't, they don't want to push you on, but they like you around there, you know? Well, I'm the luxury they can afford to keep. Right. And I don't know how we're going to get around this because, you know, the Roman circus keeps going on and we have to talk about the Browns in Pittsburgh. We have to talk about the Steelers, you know, and it just goes on and on. That keeps those people's uh, attention towards that and not towards what's going on. And for us in the political realm, we try to keep this Bush Clinton, uh, you know, a Republican, Democrat, conservative, uh, you know, it, it's just ridiculous. Well, you know, that, for us. you make a great point. Here's what it is. It's for people that are not interested in politics and they, like you said, and they love sports. There's always a diversion 24-7, 365. There's some sport somewhere, right? And it keeps their mind occupied. And if they're not into sports, maybe they're religious. And that keeps their mind occupied, not, not on the ball. And then the whole Republican and Democrat, then that divides the people that are interested in politics into two different separate football teams, so to speak, that can sit and argue it out while things go on behind their back that they don't pay any attention to because they're too busy being, you know, a Democrat or a Republican. And it doesn't matter, dum-dums. The, 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 the little bit of difference is like the illegal alien issue. There was a special on PBS the other night, but they just pointed out that they're here and they're working illegally and the companies are hiring them illegally. It, it's two things. The Democrats get a vote force out of it. They get the votes out of it so they don't care. And the Republicans get a workforce out of it. And it just continues, just like everything else, and freaking Gray Davis wants to give them driver's licenses. I mean, you know, he could say, I'm going to give like one out of 20 of you illegal aliens driver's license, because you always see 15 of them in an old Chevy. So, you know, why are you going to give them all driver's licenses? A new poll shows that uh, Gray Davis would lose by a wide margin if the campaign was held out there in California, and it shows that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is way ahead of everybody else. Well, there you go. You have Arnold who, you know, whatever, he might be a Republican, okay, but his issues are, I'm a social liberal and a fiscal conservative, and we kind of need the opposite. His wife ought to run. Part, <laughs> run for what? Governor. She's smarter than he is. She can at least communicate. I can understand what they say, you know, I mean, it's like, sheesh, they're only going to elect him because he's a movie star. Right, right, but the Republicans are going to go with them like they're standing up behind them. And, and it's ridiculous. We're going to have the same thing, and it's, uh, it just goes on and on. And if we elect her, maybe she'll uh, drive a Buick into a river somewhere. Well, let's, <laughs> let's, let's be fair here. Uh, I'm not a Republican, but Ronald Reagan was, I think, a pretty effective president I think he was a pretty damn good governor in California. I think he was probably a damn fine a president of the Screen Actors Guild. He was not a great actor, but uh, he was not a dumb man. He was not stupid. He understood politics. And this is where he defies the conservative Republican label put upon him. You know, he's a god to these people, and some of them people are me. But what he did with Harley Davidson and what he did with Chrysler, if it wasn't for him, they wouldn't be here right now. The people would be out of jobs, and the people who ride Harley Davidsons couldn't because there wouldn't be any new ones, and the people who drive Dodges are dumbasses. I mean, <laughs> well, so I was going to say, here's where we part company, because uh, I looked at Chrysler Corporation, and I used to be a Chrysler fan back when they had some interesting engineering. That I liked their products from the late 50s to the late 60s, early 70s. They I had always, some in interesting engineering, but they were crap. They fell apart. And I thought, if Chrysler's going to fail, let their ass fail. Yeah, but Packard you know, failed. Hudson failed. American Motors failed. I mean, you know, fail, fail. Now it's got down to the big three, and you can't lose that 
that many jobs and he looked at the he looked at the constitution and he said the government has the power to regulate commerce something that the republicans and democrats don't want to do now because all we do is make treaties that are bad for us real quick and i gotta go uh, my wife sees an old car, and I'm, you know, I'm a car person like yourself, and I, she says, ooh, what's that? And I say, uh, tell me this, it's old? She says, yes. I said, it's ugly. She says, yes. I says, well, then it's a Dodge. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. All right. See ya. I have my own problems with Lee Iacocca. Tomorrow morning on The Big One. I'll get into that next hour. Tomorrow morning on The Big One. Get your best Browns coverage with K.J., Butch Davis, Doug Deacon. Wake up informed, would you? Don't be a dum-dum. Listen to Wells and Coleman in the morning. Get your Sky Chief helicopter traffic and weather together every 10 minutes on the 10s. Begins at 5 a.m. until 9 when you listen to Glenn Beck here on News Radio, WTAM 1100. More of the program after these important words and coverage of what in the world's happening. I'm Rick Gilmore, the thinking man's friend. Right here, we on The Big One, WTAM 1100. <laughs> The following material may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Okay, okay, okay. I admit it. I was wrong. I was wrong for sitting around pushing for Bush. Push, push, push for Bush. Push, push, push for Bush. Well, now I wish I hadn't. We're in a war we'll never get out of. We're stuck in Iraq. He's $87 billion. My Aunt Fanny. Where's that money coming from, big voice man? The Rick Kilmore Show on News Radio WTAM 11. Well, now, wait a minute. I don't know if I can raise that kind of cash. $87 billion. <laughs> Evenings with Gilly on TAM. <laughs> 5, 7, 8, 11, in the classic 216 area code. The phone number here. I was calling the president a knob all night. Sheesh, a puppet. Big corporations that are taking us down the garden path. What do you think? Toll free, 888 wtam Asked the question earlier about the Amber Alert system. And why the little black girl did not get the Amber Alert, and the little white girl did. And a policeman faxed over something here. Activation criteria. The child is under 18 years of age. There is credible information suggesting the child was forcibly or intentionally removed or lured away from their location and the child remains missing. Now, did Cleveland Heights have credible information suggesting that the little white girl was forcibly or intentionally removed? Uh, no, they did not. Uh, the law enforcement agency believes the child is in danger of serious bodily harm or death. Well, I believe that any missing child, most law enforcement agencies would fear that perhaps some harm came to them. Now, number four, there is enough descriptive information about the child, the alleged abductor or abductors, and or alleged abductor's vehicle to believe an immediate broadcast alert will help. Well, Cleveland Heights clearly botched that one, too. Because there was no information about any kind of vehicle. So I think they've broken on your ball game. And I think Cleveland Heights uh, perhaps uh, should look at that policy. Chief Lens or whoever it is out there. You gotta have some there's some criteria there. You can't just be crying wolf is what it turns out to be if you if you have an amber alert every two seconds or every two weeks or then it turns out that people will ignore the amber alert and that's the last possible thing you want is them to ignore that. Yeah, I can understand. I could see that, couldn't you? If they said a little girl missing seen being dragged into a blue Chevy four door, that kind of thing. And here's half a plate. And it was in this neighborhood. And, you know, now you got all the public out there looking, too, because, gee, I, gee, I wonder why it is that child abductors and child molesters get treated so poorly in prison. Because most people have a heart and a brain, even if they are a criminal. Child molesters. What's up with that? 
They deserve all the punishment they get in prison, as far as I'm concerned. Scott, you're on the air. Yeah, hey, Rick. Good to talk to you. I've been away for the last couple of weeks, but it's always a pleasure to hear your voice. Oh, well, I enjoy the calls. Well, thank you. I wanted to correct something that was said earlier. The president's not a knob? No, oh. he's a total weenie bag. Oh, well, pfft. now that we're down to the 12-year-old level again, let's have a serious conversation about <laughs> politics. He's a poopy stinker. You know. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you can call him anything you want, I guess. This is America. I just seem to... Uh, I, I was wrestling with the idea that, boy, I really should, being an honest man, come on the air and say, you know what, I'm sorry that I supported this guy, because I am. I made the mistake of voting for him, too, and I, I'm with you 100%. Now, what I wanted to correct was a statement that Bill Clinton and or, and or Hillary Clinton said we deserve 911. Neither, buddy, neither of them said that. Uh, no, I questioned that myself. You know, I've heard that thrown around. I mean, you know, he might be a, a, a shifty scoundrel, like I was described by the scene magazine when they made me best radio personality of the year. They said I was a shifty scoundrel, but... Uh, I mean, Nazi He's a shifty bags. scoundrel. I'm not a shifty scoundrel. Nazi gas bags like Limbaugh or Hannity may say that, but no. I mean, you check the record and they didn't say that. I also get a little amused about some of the radical right-wing redneck robots, and yeah, that's you, Jake, if you're listening. <laughs> Um, about Wesley Clark. Always I mean, a forum for discontent, the Rick Gilmore program, isn't it? My callers, if we put them all in a room, they'd kill each other. <laughs> More than likely. <laughs> More than likely. I mean, this man is a four-star general. He got it for a reason. He has Purple Heart, Silver Star, Congressional Medal of Honor. Broad Scholar. So, yeah, he served his country honorably. He didn't go AWOL from the Texas Air National Guard for 13 out of 24 months. And he didn't say, like, Dick Cheney, well, no, you know... No, I was, I was uh, busy, I was busy, I was busy. Yeah, I had I, better things to do than yeah. serve my country. Yeah, I was busy. <laughs> yeah, bingo. Um, Wesley Clark would be the best thing that ever happened to this country, and I'm glad he's running because I plan on switching my party registration from Republican to Democrat in March to vote for him. I was just warned by inside sources. They said, be careful, be careful. He may not be what he seems. See, I don't believe that. I think he's had an epiphany. I mean, I voted for Bush. I supported the war in Afghanistan. I, I served in Desert Storm 1. Well, I did not serve in Desert Storm 1, but I did support George Bush, and I did support the war in Afghanistan because I thought we were going to get to some terrorist end there. Uh, the, the, the Iraq thing, to me, is just a complete mystery. Well, I mean, it's done to avenge Daddy. It's done to enrich Halliburton. And it's a perversion of everything this country stood for, and it puts us on the moral equivalency of Nazi Germany. Uh, well, ya, ya You know, I mean, walking into, you know, we're going into countries that never did anything to us. I mean, even Bush, as much of a weasel as he is, had to come out and finally admit that Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11. Yeah, he did, too. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and people that people told me when this whole thing started and I was against the war in Iraq, they said, Rick, you're going to end up with egg on your face because you're wrong. And I said, well, I'll take my chances. And you know what? I do not like to sit here on the backs of dead and dying soldiers in Iraq and sit there and say I was right because I support the troops. They're just told where to go. Oh, exactly. But they better have a goddamn good reason to be told to go die. They yeah, better have exactly. a goddamn good reason to be told to go die, and I don't see that reason in Iraq. And, I mean, we've got a domestic situation where John Ashcroft would make Heinrich Himmler smile. Yeah, we'll yeah. What he's doing. The this propaganda is... machine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Yep. No, I just wanted to call and let you know that, uh, get this a couple things off my chest. Wes Clark, you know, people, if you're out there and you have half a brain in your head, and, again, this excludes you, Jake, <laughs> think for a second, study... And get to know Wes Clark. He's not with the right-wing hate mongers on talk radio and on the Nazi news channel. That's otherwise known as Fox. Um, you know, what they try to put him out to be. Let me, let me tell you what I did. Mm -hmm. Let me interrupt you here. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. That's, uh, you know, I, was, no, I thought you were going to say you hate Jake again. We'll just throw that in real quick. Huh? Um, <laughs> I went to draftwesleyclark.com, mm -hmm. and I got a hold of whoever the guy is in charge of it. I emailed him, and I said, well, why don't you try and see? I got a 50,000-watt radio show. Why don't you see? I mean, I seem to like the guy enough. I'm curious. I'd like to know more about him. 
See if you can get him to contact me or, or maybe be on the show, be on the phone or something, you know? Mm. Well, apparently, if you go to draftwesleyclark.com, they mean well, but they are not associated with Wesley Clark in any way, shape, or form. They're just a grassroots organization trying to get a movement going. Let me give you a website that anybody out there who's really progressive or anybody who really wants to think for themselves will go to. I'm sure you've probably heard of it. It's moveon.org. Move? Uh, one word? Yeah, M O V E. O N dot O R G. No, I, you know, I'm not a complete Luddite, but uh, there's a lot of websites out there, and I had not heard of that one. Well, they're starting a new grassroots initiative, and it's gotten up to 2.6 million signatures. And if you go to there, you can probably add yours onto it to bring back the fairness doctrine. Oh, I see. My boss would pull his hair out because if I have one candidate on, that means I have to have them all on. No, that basically means that, you know, if you have three hours of just, you know, radical right-wing Nazism like Limbaugh, then you just have to balance it with three hours of somebody progressive or liberal. That's oh, dear God, everybody out there. Please, within the sound of my voice, go to moveon.org and, and get the Fairness Doctrine back, and that way it's job security for me. No, well, definitely. I mean, you know, you're... With the exception of a guy down here in the Akron area, who I won't name, but you're the only one I've heard on talk radio who bothers to use his brain. Okay, well, you, you can name anybody you want. We're a big, we're a big boy here. I don't and care. A old guy used to be in Cleveland in the 1950s, Joe Finan. Joe Finan, yeah. I wonder how he's doing. I thought he had a heart attack or something. No, he had a quintru uh, quintuple bypass. Wow, wow. Pork, the other white meat, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and he said... They're uh, switching just, to the egg beaters now, Joe, I guess. Huh? Yeah, just to fill you in real quick, he said that he went. He wasn't even experiencing discomfort. And the doctor checked him out and said, well, you've got to get to the hospital. And Joe said, okay, well, when do I schedule? And they put him right in an ambulance and took him there. Wow, that sounds like a guy I know who had an aortic aneurysm starting. Mm -hmm. he, had, he could feel his heart beating in his stomach. He had a quintuple bypass, was out for the entire month of uh, August, but he's back now and he's given, you know, he's given the little right wingers hell, which I, I was like. How old is Joe? 73. Oh, okay. All right, just curious. He comes from an era of people like Gary D. and uh, back when George Forbes used to have a radio program. When is George Forbes going to run for mayor of Cleveland so we can get this nonsense over with and get Ladybug Jane Campbell, the queen of the flying hubcap, back on TV with Dharma and Greg? Yeah, you know, I would take... But doesn't she look like Greg's mother? Oh, God. Oh. And Dharma and Greg? <laughs> Susan I, Sullivan. I, 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 I'm flipping through and I see I see Dharma and Greg, which I never hardly ever watch, but I saw this lady and I go, that's that's our mayor. She's well, she's on a TV show. I mean, I take Mike Mike White back. Wow, wow. Now there's a I'd, I'd have to wrestle with that one. Because at least I mean he might have been authoritarian and all that, but he at least got some things done. Jane Campbell's just there. You know, you've heard of the t uh, the uh, movie Sleepless in Seattle. Uh, she's clueless in Cleveland. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing but ribbon cuttings and partnering with this community, that community, the gay community, the black community, partnering with high school children or whatever. You know, everything's a partnership and nothing's getting done. You'll get a kick out of this. Everything's a photo op. On Channel 55, every Friday night, Saturday morning from like 4 in the morning to 6, the ghoul is on. Yes, yes. Uh, this week, they had the Kucinich presidential campaign on it. <laughs> For real? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they had some woman, I mean, not a bad-looking blonde, but she was out passing buttons and go, Dennis, and, you know, wow. a lot 2%. I had the ghoul at my wedding. Oh, Ron Schweet, huh? Okay. Yeah, yeah, he was at my... You know, i got to tell you a story about him. It's absolutely hilarious. He gave me a couple of beautiful folding chairs mm -hmm. and a rubber chicken. <laughs> and he's sitting in the back of the, well, of the wedding reception, in, in the back of the hall, and him and my parents' neighbor are sitting there, and they took the little metal rings off of the scrolls that come that you get, you know, the scrolls that list uh, the, the wedding party and all that, mm -hmm. and they had them in their nose. That's what's in our photo album from that uh, ill-fated day. And... He picks up, everybody's dancing, everybody's busy, they're all in line to get food. So there's about seven empty tables around where he's sitting. Mm -hmm. and he goes around and he starts picking up the people that they have their little throwaway cameras that they bring to weddings, uh, you know, to take pictures. Mm -hmm. And he's taking pictures of his underarms, and he's taking pictures <laughs> of his backside. He goes, yeah, isn't it great when you go to a wedding, they just leave these cameras sit all around for the guests to have fun with? How old is he now? Oh, I don't know, probably... Uh, Early 60s? No, no, not that old. Okay. Uh, well, let's, put it, let's do the math. In 19... 1964, he was 14, right? Okay. So he's about 53. 
That's my guess. 52, 53. Because I remember him in the late 60s before he went to Detroit. He was on WKBF Channel 61. And they always played their theme music, Bird Camford, Win Wonder Winterland by Night, I think it was. Yeah, it was uh, Kaiser Broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And now they sell widgets and jewelry. Something, I don't know. Well, thanks for that trip down memory lane there, all right? No problem. Again, everybody out there, go to moveon.org, get the Fairness Doctrine back, and also go West Clark and Jake. I still love you, friend. All right, well, I want to get everybody together and have a steel cage death match. I still think that the hamburger helping hand and the Arby's oven mitt ought to get together and duke it out to the death. Win or eat all. Before I uh, get uh, too far off track here, I want to give you a triple dot forecast from TV3's Eileen McShay. Tonight, cloudy, cool, scattered showers, mid-40s. Tomorrow, more of the same, but mid-50s. So it's the same weather tonight as it will be tomorrow, which is a 10-degree difference in temperature. Currently, 50 degrees in Cleveland, 50 degrees. You know, you can go out and meet Glenn Beck. Go out there Friday, October 3rd at Borders in Westlake, that real nice bookstore out there at the Promenade. And get an autographed copy of his new book, the Real America, Messages from the Heart and Heart, Heart and Heart and, I, that's twice I've done that, Heart and Heartland. Listen to Glenn Beck weekday mornings at 9 on, on us, the big one, and call him up and say, Rick Gilmore said the president's a knob, and he's clueless, and he doesn't have any idea what he's doing, and we're stuck in Iraq forever, and he'll chew you a new one. He probably can't get through, he's probably busy, something like that. Anyway, I wanted to mention that uh, Ilya Kazan died, he was 94. Lots of great films. He was reviled by many in Hollywood for naming former Communist Party members to the House Committee on Un-American Activities uh, during the McCarthy era. That will always be a stain on his reputation. He was given an honorary Oscar in 1999. Many in the audience refused to applaud. Commie bastards! Let me give you a list of his films, a partial list, ones you might have heard of. Uh, a Tree Grows in Brooklyn, 1945. Uh, Gentleman's Agreement, 1947. Panic in the Streets, great movie, 1950. 1950. Was Richard Widmark, I believe, and he was a Navy officer. And Zero Mostel was some guy that brought in some creeping crud by being on some Algerian fishing trawler. And I believe that was the same movie, wasn't it? You'll correct me if I'm wrong. Anyway, some disease is going to spread throughout New York or Philly or San Fran or one of those. And... So they have to nip it in the bud before it spreads. Streetcar Named Desire, 1951. Viva Zapata! With Tony Quinn, I think, 1952. On the Waterfront, 1954. East of Eden, 1955. Baby Doll, great movie. Carol Baker, I think, 1956. Her and Eli Wallach. He's a lecherous old man who wants to pork a little cutie. <laughs> For lack of a better word. One of my favorite movies. A Face in the Crowd, 1957. If you've not seen A Face in the Crowd, please, please go to your local video store and rent it. It is Andy Griffith's crowning glory. It is a complete rip on Arthur Godfrey, in my take. Fantastic movie. Black and white. Andy Griffith's this hillbilly. He was in jail. But he can sing and entertain people. And Patricia Neal, is that her name? believe it was, she m makes him into a movie star, a TV star, I should say. And she gets him out of jail, she helps him along, gets him on local radio, and then he moves up the ladder, and so then he becomes this folksy kind of guy on the TV, but in real life, he's a jerk. He dumps Patricia Neal, he's out, you know, sniffing around, getting chicks anywhere he can find them, and I don't want to ruin the end of the movie for you, but it's Andy Griffith at his finest. I mean, forget, I mean, yeah, I was a big fan of the Andy Griffith Show. I do not believe that Andy Griffith, the Andy Griffith Show, or Matlock, or any of those cruddy movies he made in the 70s, would even have ever existed if it were not for Ilya Kazan's A Face in the Crowd. Fan-freaking-tastic is all I can say about that movie. Let's move on. Splendor in the Grass, 1961. And I'm looking on the list here. Uh, well, why did they throw in, this is all out of order. Tea and Sympathy, The Changeling, America, America, Sweet Bird of Youth, lots and lots of cat on a hot tin roof. 
There's a lot of other stuff in here that I never heard of. Deeper the Roots, or Camino Rio, or, you know, maybe they're good films and I just missed them. Anyway, Ilya Kazan, you know, you get these people that come along. Eh, I don't love him or hate him, or whether he was pointing out commies and pinkos back in the 50s. Uh, pfft, I, pfft, you you got to consider the people that would not stand up and applaud when an old man gets an award at the Oscars. They're idiots. They're Californians. They're about to elect a, a, a foreigner that uh, is a movie star, and he's going to probably be their next governor. What are they, idiots? Uh, for, quite frankly, yes. Dean, you're on the air. Hey, Rick. Great show. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to make a point about Wesley Clark. He's, uh... Is it for certain that he's going to make a run for the presidency? Uh, do you know if he's... Uh, Definitely going into this uh, Democratic... Uh... Well, what happened was he was kind of like Eisenhower. He didn't have any idea which party he even wanted to run on. And then he decided, well, obviously, the way to run is, you know, to... Obviously, he's not gonna... He's not gonna beat Bush in some kind of non-existent right. primary or whatever. I mean, he had to run as a Democrat. Okay, so I think he's a shell of the, well, of the Clintons. Well, before you say that, now, think about what uh, he may be doing. He may be... Uh, a winner. He may be an extremely smart winner who uh, has realized that I'm going to run for the presidency under the Demo Democratic ticket. Why not just bring on the team that has won recently, bring on the people that know how to win. You know, he may not, uh, he may not be, just because he has Clinton people with him, he may even have them along because of their winning experience. Well, let me just say this, though. I think that we should all just watch and listen and wait right. and see. I mean, don't just go throwing all your eggs in the Wesley Clark basket just yet. I'm just telling you what I was warned from some insiders. Yeah, well, they may be seeing him take on a bunch of these Clinton people, but maybe not realizing, uh, you know, maybe they don't understand uh, the teamwork aspect of uh, him thinking these people have been on a winning team. I'll get them on my team to help me win. He may not uh, believe in their uh, philosophy at all. But, well, that's uh, it's, it's possible. It's possible. Uh, thanks for checking in there. It's possible. Let's put it this way. There are probably a lot of people sitting within the sound of my voice that are fans of at least Bill Clinton. I mean, that guy was more Teflon than Reagan. Like him or hate him, either way. It was just peccadillo after this, after that, after, you know, 48 dead people all around him that, you know, you can't account for what happened to all of them, but no, I wouldn't certainly say, certainly not. Harumph! Harumph! There's a lot of dead people, or, you know, but there's a lot of people within the sound of my voice that were probably fans of the Clintons and look back fondly on an era where the economy was growing and growing and growing and growing and the stock market was through the roof and you made a lot of money. And whether the Clintons had anything to do with it at all or not, now you're looking at George Bush and you're looking at the quagmire that were in in Iraq. That's why I thought I'd replay that, that Dick Fagler interview I did with him. Uh, he's, do you think Dick Fagler is a dummy? I don't think he's a dummy. We agreed on, on, on the war in Iraq. It's, it's going to be something with no end. Mike, you're on the air. Hey, Rick, how you doing? Great. Hey, you know, uh, you said something before. You said... Uh... The show is supposed to make you think. I'm going to try to make you think right now. Sure. Um, you know, remember back in uh, when Kennedy got assassinated? Yeah. You know, yep. how the media probably, you know, back then I, I wasn't old enough to really, you know, know what was going on. I was just a kid. And, uh, you know, how the media probably played it up and kept the, kept your mind on, you know, um, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald and everything. And, you know, what do you believe? Who do you believe, uh, do you believe uh, Lee Harvey Oswald pulled the, the trigger that, um, sh you know, killed uh, Kennedy back then? Uh, you know, uh, that'd be one magic loogie, huh? I mean, you know, I, okay. I, I think that, that there were people that said that they saw smoke on the grassy knoll, and I think that there were more than one shooter. I, I, I think that that's just the, you know, they, they tried to take an expert and take that Italian rifle with a bold action. And right. try and crank off those shots in as quick a time as it would take and be accurate. I, d I think that's damn near impossible. Okay, now I'm going to make you think now, too. The World Trade Center, okay? I believe, you know what happened with that? Huh. And I've read a few things. I believe those two jets didn't bring down those two buildings. I believe those buildings were brought down from the bottom. I've ta if you talk to some demolition experts and get some on maybe one time, how do you bring down a building, Rick? 
It doesn't take no, no rocket scientists. You bring them down from the bottom. All right. You okay, know, I'm up, on, I'm up on the news there, Tiger, but I will tell you what I will do. I will try my damnedest to look into that one. I believe something to do with the construction of the building was also why they fell down. I think the planes took them down, but they, that's just me. Rick Gilmore, the thinking man's friend. More of the program after these important words on Cleveland's only news radio station, WTAM 1100. Fun. Gilmore. You poked the thing through or you didn't poke the thing through, okay? Pokey. On News Radio WTAM 1100. Yeah, that was a word from Dimple Chad. It's better than Hanging Chad. I think Hanging Chad hangs out in gay chat rooms or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alrighty. Drudge Report after the top of the hour. I am amazed at the number of people who did not hear the interview that I did with Dick Fagler. It was rather lengthy. It was funny when I, when I talked to him off the air, and I respect him a great deal. He said, well, how long do you want, Rick? I said, well, you can give me two minutes or two hours. <laughs> it's your call. He said, how about about 20 minutes? I said, okay. And I was talking to a buddy of mine, and I says, you know, I'd like to have Fagler get me on his program sometime. Why not? And I says, you know, he can't keep doing that program forever. I could do it. He says, you don't have the looks for TV, Rick. I said, what, and Dick Fagler is Tom Selleck? <laughs> I says, I've done TV before. You don't have to have any special... He's sitting there trying to make you think. And some people think that he's been obsessing a bit on the war theme himself. It's not obsessing. It's important. That's why. There's people dying over there, remember? They ain't just numbers. They're American citizens. They're soldiers dying over there almost every day. So listen to this and Think. It's me and Dick Fagler from, I don't know what, a couple weeks ago. Something like that. Dick oh, Fagler. Yeah. There we Hi, Rick. Go. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. I'm a big fan. You know, I'm a big fan of yours, and I don't know if you mind or not, but I read your stuff on the air once in a while. That's great. I, I think There's no money in it, but it's great. You're the only guy that makes any sense around here. <laughs> I mean, I make some sense, too, I think, but it uh, seems to me that we're just... We've got problems politically, a uh, uh, quagmire here and overseas, don't we? We seem to, yeah. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, we had an entrance plan uh, into Iraq. Did you watch any? Did you get the, the chance to see any of 60 Minutes tonight? I did not. Uh, they were talking about now there's a faction, some private army in Iran that w wants to march to Baghdad. Well, everybody wants to march to Baghdad because what we've done is create a terrorist magnet in Baghdad for all the terrorists who hate America, who want to come over there and, and, and duel with us. Yeah, it seems that way. No matter whether we do something proper, there, there are terrorists out there who want to tear it down just because it's us doing it. Sure. It doesn't matter what we do. Uh, is, do you think that we had, when we went in there, do you think that we had any kind of an exit plan? Oh, no. Do you? No. <laughs> I think they thought it was going to be... Now, I think, would you agree that it, we knew it was going to be kind of a cakewalk to go in and take over the country? Oh, yes. Everybody thought we could beat the Iraqi army. There was no question about that. The question was, having beaten them, what do we do next? And that's still the question. And it was, Rick, the same question that happened in Vietnam. In 1965, in the Idrag Valley, we uh, found the North Vietnamese Army in the field and defeated them. And then the generals turned to Washington and said, what do we do now? And never got an answer. Well, and... Uh well, we all know how long we were in Vietnam. Quite a while. Quite a while, and it's amazing. People jumped right on that bandwagon when we were in Iraq for two weeks. They were already saying, oh boy, it's going to be another Vietnam. Well, now that we've been there and we keep losing, people, someone commented to me last night, they said, why is it when they list the number of dead in Iraq, they never tell you who they are or, or what their name is? I says, I'm old enough to remember, and this person was 28, I says, I'm old enough to remember the daily death count in Vietnam. I said, I think the government does that. I don't know. What do you think? I think they, they don't tell you any names or any faces or anything. It's, it's, that way it's a sanitized, clinical, oops, we lost three today. Well, let me tell you this. I was against this war from the beginning. I got a flag flying in front of my house. I was in the military myself for three years, and I'm proud of it. I have my commission hanging on the wall of my den. Uh, I am not anti-American. Uh, some of the right-wing rhetoric you hear about this is, uh, why do these people who are against the war hate America? I do not hate America. I love America. After the Twin Towers went down, I was all for going out and finding Osama bin Laden, who, had, who ever do, had done that. We went to uh, Afghanistan to try to find him and didn't. And then we made a, a sudden left turn 
and went into Iraq, a country which had no possible way of endangering us that we've found so far, and now we're barred down over there. And apparently without any kind of exit uh, strategies, you pointed out. I mean, the Vietnam War should have taught these people a lesson, which should have said, don't get in unless you know how the hell you're going to get out. And these people have no idea now how they're going to get out. And having snubbed the U.N., apparently now we're going to turn to the U.N. and say, please help us with this. And that's going to take an awful lot of smoothing to get them to do that. Yeah, it's funny, when we went in, it was funny, I was speaking with a friend of mine who mentioned, he says, when we went into Iraq, he says, we, we didn't want a coalition. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, under NAFTA, we own the mineral rights to Canada, so if they didn't want to help us, we could just say, all right, well, then we want some cheap oil. Now, and he says, you know, when we own the spigot in the Middle East, everybody else is going to have to line up like China and Russia, and we'll decide who we like better that week as to who gets the, the oil. Let me tell you what horrifies me most about this, Rick. Uh, we did something here that we haven't done for a hundred years. Uh, I'm not going to say this is the first time we, we, we struck preemptively and said, we haven't been attacked yet by a country, but we're going to do that to them until they did it to us. I wouldn't insult your listeners by saying that. The Spanish-American War was rather similar. But uh, in this case, uh, after a hundred years of having a doctrine that said that we're not going to fight unless somebody's attacked us, we went in there and did a preemptive strike on a country which not only had not struck us, but uh, from what we've learned so far, had, didn't have the, uh, the, the capability to strike us. And we're still looking for the weapons of mass we're still destruction. Looking for the weapons of mass destruction, which we will not find. All right. And uh, this is a major, major thing. This is a major turn in American foreign policy, if there is such a thing as American foreign policy. But what horrifies me most is I don't think the American public really cares. It's amazing, and for those of you just joining the program, I'm speaking with Cleveland's best commentator, uh, Dick Fagler. Sam Donaldson had said something once a couple of years ago that stuck in my mind when he said, the American public takes news stories nowadays and just chews them up and spits them out so quickly that their attention span is so short it's hard to keep up. Right. And I thought, I've, I, don't, I don't really bump into many people when I'm out at a restaurant or out, out uh, in a, a, a drinking establishment. Or, uh, the, the war in Iraq does not seem to be on the tip of everyone's tongue anymore, unless, of course, you have someone in the service that's actively involved. And there aren't that many people in the service. Not enough as there ought to be, probably, if we're going to conduct our affairs like this. But every day or other days, a couple of Americans die. We had a couple die today on your newscast, you know, from Afghanistan. Uh, little by little, they're dying. They're staying over there longer than they should have because we haven't got the forces to back them up. We're in an army of occupation now. We're trying to uh, pacify this nation, which is luring terrorists in by the day. Uh, it struck me as a very ill-advised, unthought-out plan. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I've been against this war since, be since before it began. And now you start hearing from folks the rumblings of people like General Wesley Clark. Who, yeah. who claims he wants to run for president, although uh, as far as the new poll that just came out today, apparently most Am Americans have no idea who the Democrats are at all. And, and he was the one who was saying, and he was Allied Supreme Commander of NATO for a number of years, four-star general, a decorated Vietnam War combat veteran. And he said, what was the imminent threat? What was the danger from Iraq? And, and even, I cannot, Dick, I cannot even get the hawks to answer this question. What's the correlation between 9-11 and Saddam Hussein? Well, they can't answer it. They shifted to, well, isn't it a great thing that we toppled Saddam? Well, yeah, it's a great thing we toppled Saddam. But that wasn't why we went in there. I watched, as you did, Colin Powell go before the U.N. and try to make a case for the fact that these people were, had the machinery uh, to attack us almost any day. That has been proven false. So we're marauding around in a country that really could not attack. Look, look where we were before we went into Iraq. We were bombing Iraq daily. We had uh, divided the country into three sections. We had contained Saddam in the middle of it. We were bombing the other two. We had uh, U.N. inspectors crawling over, all over the ground. Uh, there was no way these guys were a threat to us at all. And it was never proven that they were. So the administration either lied to us or were so dumb they didn't know what they were talking about. Well, they were I, don't also see a, I don't see a third option. 
They were also talking today about the huge profits that Bechtel and Halliburton are going right. to be making over there. And I, I still think there's a correlation in this administration between some of the players and big oil. You know, there may be. I, 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 I'm tempted to agree with that. But I hate to think that. You know, what I think is that uh, Bush gets up there and says, we're going to fight terrorists. You know, terrorists. He leaves out the line. And thought, because we were all plumped up and ready to hit anybody in the nose we could find after a, a 9-11, that it would be Iraq. But I really am disappointed in the public more than I am in Bush. Let me ask you another question. Do you think that there are possible acts of terrorism that have gone on that they brush under the rug because if they don't tell us it's terrorism, it's not terrorism, and that way we're not terrorized? Like where? Well, like the, the plane that went down over Queens... Shortly after 9-11, I was speaking with an airline mechanic who said that would be like you getting in your car, Rick, and driving up the street and having the doors and the hood and the trunk fly off, yet no one tampered with it. You know, Rick, I don't know, and I can't speculate about that. All I can say is I know what we're doing now, and what we're doing now in Iraq, every American soldier who dies in Iraq is dying not just in uh, the uh, Republicans' name or George Bush's name, he's dying in our name. We sent them there. The most serious thing a nation can do is to send its, its young men and young women off to make war. Nothing gets more serious than that as an instrument of, uh, of national policy. And again, it bothers me that there seems to be such indolence on the part of the people of America. They just don't care because this is supposed to be a volunteer army. Well, they asked for it. You know, they're getting it. That's crazy. What I'm wondering about, too, is I've had people say to me, well, how can you not support this war and yet say you support the troops? Well, you can. There was a sign uh, somewhere south of Akron the other day, a lawn sign, that said, God bless our troops, God help our government. And I rather like that sign. Well, it's interesting that this is even worse than Bush the Elder. When Bush, oh, yeah. When Bush the Elder went in, it didn't drag on forever. There was still a Saddam, an evil man there, to keep his people under his thumb. And he was an evil man, but he did keep the country in check. Uh, well, and, well, you know, the consensus here, if we were looking for one, would be everybody agrees Saddam was an evil man. And it was a terrible regime he ran. There's no argument about that from anybody I've heard. Right. The question is, what do we as America do about that? And if we embark on the kind of adventure we just have, where does it stop? Who decides where we go to flesh out evil men who run uh, terrible dictatorships? You know, uh, and, and, and there was no debate. And by the way, I've been accused of Bush bashing many times, but the Democrats uh, shouldn't get any stars on their foreheads for this thing. They shut up, rolled over, and played dead. There was no debate in Congress, as there was before when, when Bush the Elder uh, sent our troops to, uh, into Desert Storm. You remember there was a, a, a fantastic debate in Congress about whether we should go. This time, because primarily of the emotional feeling we had after 9-11, the Democrats just uh, shut up and said, okay, I guess I can't oppose this, you know. And I think the Democrats uh, really are as much miscreants here as anybody in the Bush administration is. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Now, tomorrow morning on the big one, wake up informed with Wells and Coleman, which are weekday mornings here, currently 67 degrees in Cleveland, 67. Speaking with Dick Fagler, and I think, well, let's go over there a little bit. Uh, uh, like the poll says, most people don't know who the Democratic candidates for president are. Well, just like Bush the Elder had a tanking economy, right. now we've got one that's tanking even worse now. Well, than... you saw the headline on the paper this morning, I think. I haven't got it in front of me, but uh, Ohio's lost so many manufacturing jobs, so many jobs. The economy is down. Uh, the Wall Street Journal report, which plays this merry little tune every morning on my, in, in my radio, says, well, the economy's on the rebound. The only thing we haven't got is jobs. Now, I should have taken more economics courses because I can't understand how if you're losing jobs, paying jobs constantly, losing good paying jobs constantly, the economy could be on the rebound. So it seems to me, sitting here, that this president has a potential quagmire in foreign policy and a fading economy at home. I think he's in trouble. And, but conversely, who, who could beat him? Well, that's a good question. I mean, Dennis Kucinich just came out. He's got a proposed economic plan that will allow more than 2 million unemployed Americans to find work improving the nation's infrastructure. Well, you know, Dennis is much maligned, and God knows I've maligned him as often as anybody else has. Yeah, me too. 
But Dennis and Dean are the only ones who, right from the beginning, said we should not have embarked upon this adventure in uh, in Iraq. Uh, I saw Kerry today on one of the uh, Sunday Blab shows trying to do a uh, 180 on the fact that he voted for us to go in, but now he thinks, well, I didn't say that fast, you know. But uh, I don't know that we have uh, anybody in the field who is capable of beating this guy because the polls all show this guy, uh, Bush, is doing fairly well. And you know John Kerry is now John F. Kerry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Kerry F. K., right? Yeah, right. You know, it's funny because they, they had him on one of the news shows and they were... they had, First they interviewed Wesley Clark. This was a couple of weeks ago, one of those Sunday morning shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, Clark seemed very honest. Uh, he did not seem like a politician. He seemed like a general that was just telling you, here's exactly what's going on and why we're in trouble over there. Uh, from a general's perspective who also may or may not be running for president or someone's vice presidential candidate. Then they show Kerry, and they show how he rides away from all his speaking events on a Harley with no helmet on to show what a rebel he is. But he doesn't show up on a Harley. He shows up on a Cadillac limousine. They just truck the, they truck the Harley along so he can ride off on it for an instant photo op. And I'm thinking, you know, at least when they talked to Wesley Clark, he seemed like he was honest. He seemed like another Eisenhower. He seemed like, well, he didn't know which party he even wanted to run on. He just thought, well, if he runs as a Democrat, then maybe he can beat Bush. Well, it merely seems to me that here we have embarked on something which is really rather unique in the history of our foreign policy adventures. Uh, and we embarked on it, I think, primarily spurred on by the emotion, which we all felt, I certainly did, and I know you did, after 9-11. Uh, but the question is, is this the direction we want to lead our country in? Is there going to be a Pax Americana? Are we now in charge of the world? And we, we, we've embarked on this without any kind of meaningful debate. It becomes one of these normal talk show, yap, 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 liberals versus conservative deals. You know, I voted in my time probably for more Republicans than Democrats. But when I come out against the war, I'm branded as some kind of a uh, tree-hugging liberal. Well, I'm not a tree-hugging liberal. I just don't like the way we're going here. But the quality of the debate in, in, in America about what America ought to do has been reduced to bumper stickers, one-liners, and snarls. And this is all far too important for that. Absolutely. You're absolutely right, because I supported George Bush. I sat for months and months and said, we don't want President Gore because I'm worried because my friends in the military said that the military was weakening under the Clinton okay. administration. All right, let me, let me interrupt you for a minute. Okay. I was not a Gore man either. I would have voted for McCain, but I never got a chance to because he got gunned down before the primary rolled around in Ohio. Uh, but I, I say that in the interest of full disclosure because, you know, I didn't think Gore was the guy. I didn't think Bush was the guy. My guy didn't get a chance to run, but I would have voted Republican. As somebody who would have voted Republican, I, I just absolutely uh, just befuddled by what, where Bush and his advisors, the Wolfowitzes of the world, the Pearls of the world, the Rumsfeld of the world, have taken him. And, you know, you said earlier this oil thing. Frankly, Rick, I hate to even think about that because that would make me feel even worse than I feel. If it was just misguided policy, I guess I could stand that. But if somebody's doing this because they can line their pockets, I would really feel low. Well, and, and like you mentioned, when all of a sudden you come out against the war, you're a tree-hugging liberal. The same thing happened to me. All of a sudden, not, not just a tree-hugging liberal, Dick Fagler. They're also saying it's un-American. Right. The Bush administration has put forth this notion that if you question the government, which is especially important during times of war, I feel, that, that if you question anything, heaven forbid you do that or you're, you're unpatriotic. The rhetoric, the, the rhetoric on, the, uh, on the right is, in, in, in some sections of the right, not, not the whole right, there's some sections of the right is, too many liberals hate America. But Rick, you know, I'm older than you are. I wish I weren't, but I am. But you heard the same kind of thing in Vietnam. You know, America love it or leave it. If you don't like what we're doing there, why don't you get out? Yeah, the hard hats and the hippies. Right. Now, I'm not about to get out because, you know, uh, I don't want anybody cresting my patriotism. I just want the, uh, our country to do the smartest and best thing it can do. And this, this notion that if you object to this kind of adventure that we're on now, misguided, ill-guided, according to me, that you are somehow anti-American, 
I reject that with every fiber of my being. I'm saying, no, that's anti-American. We're not anti-American. Americanism doesn't call for these kind of adventures. Well, that kind of a, the kind of a notion, and I compared it to a kid on the playground who had been a bad kid maybe three weeks ago, and then a teacher walks up and just swats him one right across the face because he looked like he might be bad again. Well, that teacher would be fired. Well, the idea of us stomping around the world into sovereign nations deciding that we're going to make regime changes because Father Knows Best is dangerous policy and like the game of risk. If we spread ourselves too thin, you lose. And as you recall, this did not really begin as a regime change. It began because Powell tried his best, rather help, half-heartedly, I think now, uh, to make a connection between uh, the Twin Towers and Iraq couldn't do it, but we didn't really go in there just to topple Saddam. We went in there because we were, we were going to try to prove that somehow these guys were tied up in that. We went into Afghanistan, which I endorsed, by the way, and that's such a, a mirror's nest that now we can't get out of Kabul. The last two Americans killed right on your newscast tonight were killed in Afghanistan, so we haven't taped that situation down and smoothed that over very well yet. We still haven't found Osama, Osama bin Laden, who was supposed to be the guy behind the Twin Towers attack. We can't find Saddam. We're floundering around in cultures we know nothing about, trying to keep the lid on with a bare minimum of troops who can't possibly occupy these nations, who've been at each other's throats forever. And, uh, you know, what we're accomplishing by this, I'm hard-pressed to say, except body bags coming back and more chaos. And the other thing, Rick, is we still haven't solved the major question in the Middle East, which is the Palestinian-Israeli uh, uh, question. Yeah, it's a mess. You know, Mike Trevisano said something. This is a little recording here of something he said about me and talking about the war. I love Rick Gilmore. He's a good friend of mine. Well, he's a friend of mine. He's not a good friend of mine. He's a friend of mine, and I like him, okay? So when he talks about the war, he, he sounds like an imbecile. He called me right after the war started. I was sitting here saying it's a bad, bad idea. And I was reminded of this conversation last night by a gentleman I had not seen in years. He said, do you remember when Mike said to you, Oh, and you said to Mike, because Mike would, said, said, oh, you're just saying this for ratings. The reason you're against the war is for ratings. And I said, if we're still sitting here one year from now, and we're still in Iraq, am I right? And he said, yes. And I, I fully believe, Dick, we are going to be in Iraq in, in March of 2004. Well, number one, if Trevisano, who I think is a great radio uh, talent, calls you an imbecile, I wouldn't go home and weep into my pillow. No, it's actually a compliment. <laughs> if he didn't like me, he'd say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but number two, you don't do this for ratings because our position on this thing was very much in the minority. Yep, yep. So this is not a ratings grabber. I mean, uh, I don't like to sit here and rail against uh, my government's policy. I wish I could endorse it, but I can't endorse it. Yep. Dick, I appreciate you taking the time. It's always a pleasure. I should have had you on far earlier into this thing because I had to sit here every Sunday night and have people beat me up for hours and try and defend my opinion. Well, let's hear what they say now. Yeah, well, yeah, as it drags on, and I hate to say this because I don't want to say on the backs of dead and dying American soldiers that I was right. That's not my purpose whatsoever. I just said, we need to question this administration and if they really know what the heck they're doing. Look, whatever you do on your radio show that gets people interested, more interested in this than they are uh, which bachelor is the last one left standing or which <laughs> guy is the straight guy or the queer guy, yeah. I don't know. Anything you can do about that, we need to do because this is not something that's just uh, kind of a pastime for America. This is America. And the reason that many people around the world are be becoming distrustful of us is that they think that we don't, we're, we're slogging through this thing like a bull in a china shop not knowing what to do. So again, I want to say what I said before. Every American who dies, and I mourn every American who dies, every Iraqi who died, died not just in the name of George Bush or Donald Rumsfeld. They die in our name. So, believe me, we better worry about that and think about that. That's why I call myself Rick Gilmore, the thinking man's friend. Okay. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Rick. I really appreciate it. Dick Fagler, Cleveland's best commentator. Yeah, he's been around a little longer than me. Well, you know what? Maybe we ought to respect that in this society like they do in other cultures and say that people that are a little older might just be a little wiser. I'm Rick Gilmore, the thinking man's friend. This is Cleveland's News Radio, WTAM 1100. News Radio, WTAM 1100.